In the not very distant future, Christianity has been outlawed, and communism is all over the place. One man will stand against the new world order. Hello lovely people, my name is Emma, welcome back to my channel, welcome if you are new. Today we're reviewing a normal film made by a couple of normal dudes with no controversial history at all. I had a lot of fun reviewing the trailer for 2025 and it seems you guys enjoyed it and wanted to see a full review, so here you go! I put myself through hell for you, this is the worst film I've ever seen. Given that today's film features a very awkward cereal eating scene in which someone just doesn't eat cereal properly. I'm very pleased to tell you that today's video is sponsored by Magic Spoon. Magic Spoon is a super delicious and high protein cereal that brings you all of the joy and nostalgia of your favourite childhood cereals but with zero grams of sugar. I've been chomping my way through the variety pack which includes four flavours, cocoa, frosted, fruity and peanut butter. I'm eating the cocoa one right now, it does that thing where it turns the milk all nice and cocoa-y. Magic Spoon has 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs in each serving and it's only 140 calories per serving. They're also keto friendly, gluten free, grain free and soy free. I'm very invested in cereal as a snack, especially because I'm prone to snacking on sugary biscuits and things like that. Magic Spoon is not just for breakfast, it's for life. Click the link down below to grab a variety pack and try it today. Use the promo code EMMATHORN at checkout to get $5 off any order, or you can go to magicspoon.com slash EMMATHORN. Magic Spoon is backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. That means if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link down below or scan the QR code on screen. Use the code EMMATHORN or go to magicspoon.com slash EMMATHORN to get $5 off today. Thank you so much for listening and to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video. The film begins with some text-based exposition, which, to be honest, I don't love. And, spoiler alert, is completely unnecessary because all the exposition is done again later in the movie. And then again. And again. And again. And again. And again. And again. It says the world we know in 2020 doesn't exist anymore. The virus changed the world. Stuff we could work out from the plot pretty easily. It's like they always say in film, tell, don't show. But it does include our favourite line from the trailer, communism is all over the place. There's a global state? Meetings are illegal, Christianity is illegal, there's no explanation as to why. The movie proper kicks off with a J.J. Abrams Star Trek style car chase, but instead of Kirk in a Chevrolet Corvette rocking to the Beastie Boys, it's that one Wesley bro <laughs> driving a banged up Renault Clio, which I am immediately attached to because that's the car my mum drove when I was a kid, <laughs> to a song by a chap called Anton Vlasov, which is actually not that bad. Quick thing, the music in this film is pretty good. The mixing and the usage of music and timing, absolutely awful. Appalling. But the songs themselves, not that bad. Your man is driving really badly, he's swerving all over the road. It's not really clear why until a beamer with a blue cop light and a license plate that just says police uh, appears on the road behind him. It's a car chase! A really slow car chase. I guess they didn't get the appropriate permissions to film at high speed. So both the Clio and the pursuing Beamer are driving quite slowly, <laughs> with only the music and the siren to indicate that there's actually a chase happening. Mr. Wesley Bro also looks extremely chill. I thought maybe that was meant to be a character thing, but either way, it just makes this feel very mundane. Nothing is done visually to make this feel fast, so it feels really weird when the cop pulls out an automatic weapon and starts popping shots off. Now there are gunshots and the music's picking up, but it still feels really silly. Look at this shot and tell me if that feels like a high-speed car chase to you. Eventually, thankfully, the Clio pulls off onto a field and the BMW can't follow it. I'll admit I was a little confused by this. The guys will get out the car and start fruitlessly shooting after it. Whatever. Then an off-road cop car appears and I kind of think maybe they had this car and just needed an excuse to use it. I'm not really sure what was going on there. Somehow this busted old Renault Clio is still keeping ahead of the cop cars that escapes by pulling a Yui. There's a really weird transition there, which I assume is to cover the broken continuity, but it doesn't work. It just looks and feels really weird. Finally, the Clio has taken all she can handle and gently pulls off to the side of the road. Mr. Wesley bro hops over the car bonnet for some reason and I don't think he's had any stunt training. He's caught and arrested. Fade to black. Music awkwardly fades out. That car chase went on way too long but we're finally free. But Mr. Wesley bro isn't. He's being interrogated by the police. 
The scene opens with him, like, chewing on his handcuffs or something. I don't know, it's really strange. The cop interrogating our as-yet-unnamed protagonist uh, sits down with a couple of books. One is a Bible, another is a book of German basic law. Both of these are outlawed, and carrying them is high treason. Okay, so disclaimer, this is the first section of dialogue in the film, and I want to apologise for anything I get wrong. The audio is not just badly mixed in the trailer, it is throughout the film. Also, this cop character is like super mumbly. They didn't make any captions, so it's only automatic captions, which don't pick up the parts that I also can't hear, so... <laughs> Apologies in advance. Anyway, cop guy wants to know where Mr. Protagonist got these books from. But your man is too philosophical and cool to answer any questions properly. He just starts, like, waxing philosophical about life and freedom in this police interrogation. And the cop doesn't stop him. He just, like, outs himself as a dissident. He's like, yeah, I have these books because they remind me of the good old days before all these stupid laws that you're trying to enforce came in. There's some flashbacks to public events being like, remember when we could go out and be with big groups of people? Although one of the pieces of stock footage they chose has no people in it, <laughs> just empty chairs. He manages to win the cop over a bit by reminding him about ice cream. So I guess ice cream is outlawed in this world. He bangs on about freedom for a while and this cop who was interrogating him accusing him of high treason a second ago, is like, yeah, you're right, the world does suck, but what can we do about it? Mr. Protagonist Wesley Guy is like, I want to fight because of freedom, and he he spends a while repeating the exact exposition from the beginning of the film over emotional music. <laughs> I'd like to share that in my notes here I wrote, oh my god, we are five minutes in, nothing has happened, and this guy is monologuing all over the place. Is the whole film like this? Oh, past Emma, you were so innocent. So young. This is, however, our first and only real conspiracy moment. It was a virus. Something they sold us as a super deadly killer virus. At the time of writing, there were 6.8 million deaths globally attributed to COVID, and the healthcare system in most places has nowhere near recovered from overcrowding and understaffing, those delays causing more illness and death. Don't want to be a massive bummer, I just couldn't move on without talking about that particular conspiracy. Okay, we're done. Mr. Guy has been crossing out the rights in his German law book as they have been outlawed by the, the state. He starts reading them out to the cop, and can I just say it's amazing that the cop interrogating him has let this dude monologue about freedom and justice for all of this time without actually asking him any questions. Like, I'm not pro-evil world government, but this guy should be fired. He reads several of these rights out over the same emotional music, and I am getting seriously bored at this point. This film was a fucking chore. <laughs> Nothing has happened. But then suddenly, we're transported three months into the past. Mr. Guy, doesn't have a name yet, is hanging out reading the Bible, while an unnamed lady is playing the guitar. Another guy bursts in very gently <laughs> and delivers some urgent news in the least urgent tone I have ever heard. Their friend has been arrested, tortured, and killed. And I am sorry to say, I had higher hopes from the trailer. This actor's performances are terrible. All of them are terrible. They also all put their hands over their mouths during dialogue. Take one screen acting class, I beg you. The new guy's like, we gotta stop, the casualties are too high. Stop what? We don't know. Reading the Bible and playing guitar, I guess. Mr. Wesley Bro, unnamed guy, exposits some more. Dear Lord. At least 90% of this film is exposition. They've been in hiding for five years, but now Mr. Wesley Bro thinks they should do something. Which begs the question, what the fuck was their friend tortured and killed for if they haven't done anything for five years? Suddenly, we get the main character's name. Eight minutes in, his name is Roy. Still don't know the others. Nervous guy says we gotta keep hiding, and now I am just confused because apparently all they've done for the last five years is hide, and he just came in and said we gotta stop. What does he want? I am utterly baffled. It's like the writer fell asleep midway through this dialogue and forgot what was going on. Unnamed guitar lady is like, but don't we all believe in trusting God's plan? Nervous guy is like, nah, I'm out. He puts his glasses on and leaves, and we never even heard his name. Fortunately, he showed zero emotion on his face through that entire exchange, so I'm not really cut up about him going. Roy, an unnamed guitar lady, talk about how they want to change the world and glorify Jesus. Goes on and on until the question turns to, where are all the Christians? They start musing on the origins of Christianity and its illegality back then, how the Christians didn't give up. They met in secret. They touch on the legend of Christians in those days using the fish symbol to find allies. And a plan forms. Arguably not a good plan, because in the modern day, 
We all know about that legend. <laughs> then the dude fluffs his lines and we do not reshoot because there's no time. And we will find found a lot of underground churches. They decide to go out and do the fish. <laughs> do those fish? We're treated to a classic bit of evangelical contradiction here. God is in control and will fight for them. Which means he was also in control when the evil world government took over and outlawed Christianity. Roy remarks that they have some graffiti and could go do the fish thing, and I think he meant spray cans. Honestly, I wonder how much of the awful dialogue in this film would be saved or fixed if they had just made a German language film. I know the idea is to appeal to an American audience, and subtitled films do generally do really badly in America, so I get it, and I don't want to be too hard on the writing if the reason it's crazy is just because English isn't their native language, but writing is kind of important to a film and everyone speaks English and it just sounds really weird. Anyway, their new plan is to graffiti some fish. Let's just move on. Here's another slice from my notes. Oh my god, every scene goes on forever. I've never encountered this much exposition in my life and the lead female still hasn't been named. I just want this to end. Now at this point, I took a break and streamed some Sherlock Holmes, so I was actually feeling much better when I got back to it. What does every great film need? A musical montage. We see Roy and the lady graffitiing fish on the forest floor and on bins and trees. I don't love it. <laughs> they also do the full fish when they discuss that the point was that people would do half and then another Christian would see that and come and fill in the other half to show that there were allies nearby. They've obviously forgotten that they had that conversation, they just do the full one every time. Also, Roy's spray paint is blue, and the ladies is pink. <laughs> in the distance we spy, somebody in a special forces hat, watching them graffiti. A police officer spots our protagonists spray painting a tunnel, and just opens fire. Unnamed female character gets shot, while Roy runs away. <laughs> You don't see any blood or anything when she gets shot, she just falls to the ground clutching her arm, but yeah, it's fine. Special Forces hat appears behind the cop and knocks him out, quickly patching up unnamed female character. Special Forces hat does something amazing and asks the female character's name, and at 15 minutes in we learn that she is called Hannah. Unnamed... sorry, Hannah is taken back to their hideout and apparently she's lost a lot of blood, although she looks fine, just annoyed. We determine she's fine, I guess, and then Roy asks Special Forces Hat if he knows what that fish actually means. And he's like, yes, the Christian thing. This bit is amazing. Roy really awkwardly asks Special Forces Hat if he's a Christian, and then we cut to him and like, you think? <laughs> In a video about Greg Locke, I asked how people would dress up as Christians, and you know what? I have my answer. This is it. Maximum youth pastor vibes. They have a really awkward, and I know I keep saying that, but it is, you just have to trust me. They have a really awkward chat about finding other Christians. We get some more unnecessary, like, backstory history to Special Forces hat, even though we still don't know his name. Then there's another continuity error. Turns out Hannah is a nurse, or at least she was, until the new global regime. You might think that that is pertinent information to hold on to for later. It's not, won't come up again, they're just chatting. I'm pretty certain that this scene, and every subsequent scene in their hideout, is improvised. It feels a lot more real and there's a lot more repetition, and it's very awkward, and they say um a lot. Whether it works better than the monologue scripted bits? They're kind of equally terrible. Then we find out that Roy and Hannah are brother and sister. I think. She says, my brother, and nods towards Roy, and he's like, nodding, so I I'm assuming they're brother and sister. He's a great contender for my favourite line of the film. Yeah, now our plan is... we just spray fish. Brilliant plan. Exciting film. S really cool. Can't wait to see them spray more fish. I rewatched those two scenes with captions, again automated, they didn't do captions, because I couldn't believe we got through that entire exchange with all that backstory about Special Forces hat without learning his name. But we 100% didn't. I'm, I'm pretty confident they never said his name. We met Special Forces hat, he saved a main character, joined the team, told us his backstory, and we never got his name. Special Forces hat is like, I'm in. And they fist bump and go and spray more fish. <laughs> this scene has the funniest fucking ending though. I'm looking for some new sprays because I think we forgot them where we were. I'm gonna take a look at that. Alright, cool. 
If the characters were meant to not get on and it was intentionally really awkward, then I think they would have done a perfect job, but I'm pretty sure it's unintentional. Now we're in a strange girl's house whose alarm wakes her at 6.32 a.m. So she's mental. She goes to her very posh kitchen, extremely fancily dressed for breakfast, and finds a note. It says, Leia, and honestly, what the hell? We have no information about this girl. We got her name before she even had a line of dialogue. What about Special Forces hat? We watch her pour her breakfast, and honestly, I am surprised nobody goes to the bathroom and takes a shit in this movie. There is so much unnecessary nothing filling time on the screen. It's already so slow. And then we focus on her pouring milk into her muesli. Why? This goes on so long. And she eats her cereal wrong. Eventually, she opens the dang note, and it's a really weirdly scrawled note from her mum that's like, don't risk your life for people you don't know. Can't wait for some context on this. But first, we have to watch this girl very thoughtfully eat her cereal for a while. Back to the main crew, and it's more Special Forces hat backstory. He left the military because he had a girlfriend and she sided with the government. Honestly, I didn't care. It means nothing to me. I don't know this guy. I don't care about this guy. I don't know his name. I don't want to see him repeatedly robotically tell us more about his boring past. <coughs> uh... <sighs> I'm more convinced than ever that the scenes in the hideout are improvised. And you know what? Improvised scenes can work incredibly well with actors who are talented at improvisation, who bounce off each other well, who vibe, who understand their characters. That can be awesome. This is not awesome. It just means they say um all the time and like scratch their legs. Special Forces hat always has an itch somewhere. I look back at this scene and how completely pointless all of the information is and it honestly looks like something the actors would do behind the scenes to get into character and to get to know each other better. And then it got accidentally put in the film. These hideout scenes suck and they take up so much screen time. We do find out that Hannah and Roy's parents ended their lives, which makes her complete emotionlessness at this topic even weirder? I would have just cut that out of the film. It doesn't relate to anything later, it just makes her look fucking weird. Yeah, I know, I know exactly how I feel. See? This. All. The. Time. This. If you're ever gonna shoot some fun skits or little home movies and be on screen, this is my tip to you. Do not put your hand over your face while you are filming. You do not want a hand between you and the camera and the microphone. If it feels natural to use your hand, do something like that. You cheat it by being behind your face, by being somewhere back here that is not obscuring what the camera is seeing. Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna record a video for my extra channel with some like very basic, helpful screen acting tips for beginners. And I'm gonna use clips from this movie because it's so useful at showing what not to do. There's another thing that Special Forces Hat is doing in this shot, but I'll let you guess, and we'll talk about that in the extra video so that I don't take up too much time on performance here. Anyway, this scene goes on Forever! The only things of note that happen is some very ham-fisted foreshadowing by Hannah when she's like, maybe the reason we haven't been arrested is because there's somebody in the government, an employee, who is um, on our side? And then Special Forces Hat asks Hannah if he can stay with them because he assumes that cameras caught him beating that cop and he doesn't want to go home, fair enough. She says yes, we still don't know his name, I want to cry. Then he plays the guitar because he used to be in a church band. Who the fuck cares? Not me. Moving on. Lamp! Leia is working in the weird blue office that we loved in the trailer, with that big huge standing lamp that takes so much of the screen in so many shots, I still don't know why. They just love that lamp, and what's not to love? Leia incredibly overtly and suspiciously pockets some files that she got from her superior, instead of inputting them into the evil spreadsheet or whatever, it's not really clear. I want you to know I rented this in HD, I could not make sense of this list. Another evil dude is like, hi, are those the files? I'll give them to the sergeant, my daughter over there. Thank you, bye. Can confirm the performance of these characters is as bad as all the rest. I don't know why they're all working in the dark. These guys seem to be the like, world government equivalent of the FBI or whatever. And they don't seem to have any lights other than lamp. Like, how is she reading these reports? It's so dark. We quickly move on to see a Bitcoin miner, underlit by green because hacking is green. Trust me, I've seen the Matrix. And more importantly, they have a little cuddly pink unicorn. We cut back to the main team to see them heading out to spray paint more fish. Special Forces hat has, by the way, removed his hat, which was the only thing I had to identify him. He's wearing a crucifix necklace on the outside of his clothes. These are the worst undercover subversives in the world. He tells this joke. What did Corona do to Jesus? Nothing. <laughs>
Then music starts up again, and it's the same montage as earlier, but there's three of them now. Why? Roy tells Special Forces how to spray a fish, and I think he says his name, but it's so quiet. I replayed it a bunch of times with the volume cranked all the way up with the captions on. The captions didn't capture it either. I couldn't get it, so I still didn't know his name. I'm sorry, I tried. The characters are now walking and bantering, but with the sound of spray cans jiggling around, so it's nearly impossible to hear the dialogue. Then they sing. That just happens. They, they just, they sing. Cut back to the hacker and some epic hacking dubstep is playing. They've been watching the trio out their window and start, you know, Google searching the fish symbol. They start reading about salvation on Wikipedia and look up what churches looked like in 2019. Cut to our protagonist sleeping for way too long. This film does a lot of padding. There's a knock at the door which triggers a very funny pretending to wake up shot of Hannah. Roy is immediately like, special forces hat, are you a traitor? And they open the door to discover a goth. This is a very important moment because for the first time in the entire film, a character introduces herself immediately. This is Holly. Thank God for Holly. Holly is our hacker and unfortunately another terrible actor. The guys ask why they should trust her and Roy weirdly mentions the sergeant and sort of points up. I have no idea what this was about. Like they're hiding out below the police station and this is how the writers chose to convey that? Or the actor got confused and pointed to like where they filmed the set of the police station? I have no idea. I got absolutely fucking lost at this point. I felt like I skipped half the film. Holly is like, oh, you mean Lucinda? Who the fuck is Lucinda? She is an animal cracker. What? Am I taking crazy pills? What are you talking about? Anyway, Holly did some research on Wikipedia and remembered how the world used to be. She is not a Christian, but she is happy to help. And at this point, I was so pleased for a Christian movie to have a non-believer taking part. Usually in Christian movies, non-believers are enemies until they convert, but in this case, these characters actually accept her help. Yay! I laughed out loud at this bit. Holly tells us she can use her leet hacking skills to find other Christians. Roy asks the important question, is that possible? And she's like, yes, it is. It's possible? Yes, it mm. is. <sighs> <laughs> She just can, okay? Shut up. Move on. Okay, this is weird. This has happened a few times and I haven't mentioned it yet. This is a good example. Sometimes a character says a line off screen. It's not like a reaction shot. We don't see her start to speak or finish. Holly just speaks and then Hannah replies completely off screen. It's so weird. That's an amazing chance for us. Roy randomly gives the name of the character from the beginning who left, Luke. I don't know why we suddenly get that character's name now. Honestly, the name thing in this film is so fucking weird. I feel like I'm losing the plot. It's not me, right? It's the film. Okay, how to do it, but... <laughs> Hunter! Oh my god. His name is Hunter. That was such a weight off my mind, you have no idea. They want to build churches. Hunter, Hunter, says they need an army. Holly offers to get the phone numbers of all the Christians. All of them. By hacking the police, the gang plan to send invitations to Christians across different cities in the country so that they can have their own meetups. They're gonna need Bibles. Holly's gonna make DVDs with all the information. What information? Who knows? Not important. Find new, new locations. Too. Another fluff. We never reshoot. We never reshoot. Long story short, Holly is this film's deus ex machina. Miraculously, this hacker who can perform every task they need under the radar of the government just plops into their lives to move the plot forward. Another musical montage begins. Holly brings her computer stuff into the hideout. We never mentioned the Bitcoin thing again, by the way. She just was mining Bitcoin at the start of the film. Cut back to Leia in the lamp room. A woman aggressively slaps a file on her desk and I am assuming this is Lucinda? I feel like working out who the characters are, what they do, and where they are, how they relate to each other is like a detective adventure game that comes alongside the film. Lamp continues to steal the frame. We fade to black on Leia and then immediately fade back onto her. At first I wasn't sure if that really happened or if I just blinked really slowly, but no, that is a thing for some reason. Leia sneaks away while her co-worker is getting a snack and goes to a very dark room. I had to squint a lot to make this part out. Then she starts typing up the Christian conspiracy word document. Then she deletes some information, I think names, and leaves. To be confronted by Lucinda, question mark. Who is like, what are you doing here? in the place that you work. Also, she has snake earrings, which I think are pretty cool, but are kind of a lame choice for 
villain costume in a Christian movie. Also, a guy with a gun is always following Lucinda question mark around. Every scene so far with her in it, there's just a guy with a gun army marching behind her. I don't, I don't know. I just don't know. Cut to Roy and whoa, did someone slap a lot on this scene? Or am I just so used to everything being blue that my eyes can't take warm tones anymore? And Roy is monologuing again to no one. He very briefly mentions communism, which I guess is to remind us that that's a thing, since we've had no evidence of it since the opening text. For some reason, there's a cutaway to him on a train near one other guy. <laughs> I guess this is meant to represent other gatherings, so they're travelling across the country to these meetups? Except there's no one here. It's weird. I think if I have to hear this guy monologuing about freedom and Jesus one more time, I might actually die. The music is over the top, the dialogue is terrible, and we've heard him say it all before. This would have been so much more impactful if we hadn't seen him monologuing this exact same shit over emotional music right at the beginning of the film. This is like the third time, and it's arguably more important and more dramatic because this is meant to be them forming the resistance, but all I want to do is skip it I'm sick of hearing Roy talk. Leia is here, by the way. Cue another musical montage. Hannah is planning cities to arrange meetups in, Roy and Leia are walking around, Leia looks really bored, girl, that is exactly how I feel listening to this mandrone on. There's more stock footage, there's more hacking, Roy gives Leia a really aggressive, playful shove, so I guess they're falling in love. They're in the same outfit for the whole montage, so this is all happening in one day. Back in the safe house, and there's another knock on the door. This time, it's Dylan. We get his name right away, but don't worry, He's not important. He'll be gone in a minute forever. He gathered in his basement with a couple people praying, his mum, his sister. They were arrested by the cops, but he wasn't. He's like, they're gonna be killed. What can you do? Robots. Everyone in this film. Just no emotion. People literally talk about their family members being tortured and killed, and there is just nothing. No shred, no hint of feeling behind those dead, dead eyes, every single character. Roy makes him feel better in such a hilariously shit but classically evangelical way. He's like, well, your mum and sister are gonna die, but then they'll be in heaven. They'll be in a way better place. It's us here who's uh, suffering. Thanks, Roy. Here's something I can't get past. This guy, the Wesley bro, Joshua Wesley, not Roy the character, the actual dude. He is a firm believer, and yet even when this character is talking about Jesus and belief, it's so disingenuous. It's so bland. Like, I imagine he was the kind of pastor who just goes to his internal filing system and finds, like, an appropriate nice quote for whatever like, question he was asked without actually thinking about it or processing anything. He doesn't actually listen and care in the moment. He's just like, accessing Christian comforting statement number 299. Totally weird. Roy basically tells this guy to run. He can't stay here because the cops are probably watching him. But he does give Dylan some worship DVDs and encouraging Bible quotes. So it's all good. Dramatic music montage over Roy and Hannah praying. Just make a shorter film. You don't need 20 montages in your movie. Cut to Mr. Guy Cop Dude in the lamp room, dad of Lucinda, I think. Screen acting basic failed, followed by a continuity error, all in the span of a couple of seconds. So exciting. I haven't talked about film stuff that much, but the continuity error here repeats, so it stood out in being annoying and wrong to me. Basically, we cut between like a wide and a mid of this guy, and in the wide, he's got his arms on his hips, and in the mid, he doesn't. So it just he keeps doing like a freaking flapping chicken motion. He gathers the people in the lamp room and is like, hey, four cop government people, whatever, it's not really clear. We have our rules for a reason, the world is a united nation now. United currency. He tells the group that Christians are meeting up, and they must be stopped. Cut to a campfire where a little Christian gang is singing. They're singing Amazing Grace, which is what the characters were singing earlier. Some lights appear in the distance, and one of the characters is like, What if those are the cops? We're gonna keep on singing, we're gonna trust God, is Roy's response. They keep on singing, and spoiler alert, it was the cops. And actually, really banging song that I guess samples or uses Amazing Grace starts playing as the police approach. I really dig it outside the context of this film. It's a really banging tune. I'll link it for you down below. Roy immediately abandons the trust God and keep singing thing that he said 20 seconds ago and runs away while everybody else is arrested. The people the cops stumbled upon start praying and the cops are like, what the heck are you doing? Before they realize that these are Christians and everybody gets arrested. The cops are looking around, but Roy is <laughs> long gone. He does a little 
prays B on the hill and looks kind of bummed out for a second. I guess that's easier to do when you run away from the gathering you organized and let everyone else get arrested pending execution. Roy's kind of a dick. <laughs> Back at Lamp HQ, the Christian meetup problem is getting worse. Apparently the government, question mark, can track people's phones, according to certain groups, like Christians, and see that they're meeting up. Random young cop guy has noticed that Christians are meeting up in different cities, which begs the question, why haven't they arrested them? They're literally tracking their phones. They know exactly where they are and who they are and that they're meeting up and breaking the law. That's a lot of blank monitors. Lazy workers. Man guy dad of Lucinda maybe strokes a model train for a minute and monologues weirdly to Lucinda about killing Christians, while Leia is subtly listening in. They have this utterly moronic, like, we are the villains chat where they're like, people are going to start wanting their rights and freedoms, we gotta stop them. Lucinda, hilariously, suggests that people start swearing themselves to the constitution every day. Kind of a funny little dig at US culture, I kind of liked it. Dad of Lucinda, probably, is like, that's gonna work. And that, that's it. Job done. <laughs> Leia phones Roy from her work desk. I remember the layout of this room. She's in the same shared office with everyone else, with Lucinda and her dad and the other cop people. And she phones Roy to tell him what she just heard. Like, I can hear the people in the background and she is talking out loud and Leia is 100% reading off a script on her laptop in this scene. I know a sneaky auto cue when I see one. Next up, our favourite goth hacker, Holly, turns to Christianity. Which, given that the only good people she knows and the only people she's spending any time with are Christians, yeah. I hate it, but it makes sense. Holly, who now has a little cross tattoo or drawing on her face, has learned so much about Jesus in her research that she's realised she needs him. For some reason, this and only this conversation happens in German for the first half, and then they switch back to English. They pray, they apologise for their sins, I assume Holly is talking about cryptocurrency. I think it would have made for a much better movie if the Christians had aligned with people of other and no faiths in order to take down this regime. I think that would have been a much better message that we can all unite against a, you know, evil fascist slash communist overlord if we put aside our differences and work together. But no, it's a Christian movie, it's a cheesy Christian movie, so everybody who is a good guy has to convert if they aren't already Christian. What do I know? I'm not a Christian movie maker. I presume some time has passed? It's not really clear, there's been no indication, but Hannah does some quick maths on a paper plate and tells the others that they've hit a hundred thousand people in Asia. I assume meaning they have reached a hundred thousand Christians in Asia and not taken them out hitman style. I love this bit. Can you give those to Tim because he knows our contact um, down in Asia? Can you give this tiny selection of DVDRs to this guy? He knows Asia. Luke's back, and he's here to warn them. They don't have values, which is ironically something evangelicals say about atheists fairly regularly, and Roy just tells them everything. He introduces Holly as their hacker who can delete all the tracks. You fool, Roy! Hunter and Luke argue a bit, and it's really awkward. I think it's unscripted again. It's very cringy and, I don't know. Luke leaves. Roy and Leia are taking a walk again. Doing speeches, that's, that's really my thing. No, it's not Roy. Monologuing is not your thing. Please stop. Roy confesses he fancies Leia because it's not a Christian movie without a terrible romantic subplot. They hold hands, they're in love, it's great. And at this point, I stopped the movie because I remembered the news that everyone had been sharing about this Wesley bro and his wife, and yeah, the actor in this movie is his now wife. The, she's finally 18 lady. At the beginning of this movie I called Leia a girl because I felt like she looked really young, and then when it was clear she was playing an adult I was like, oh she just has a young face, I feel a bit bad, but she is really young, like, in this movie she was only like 2021. 20, just puts a really weird spin on the romance of this film. Anyway, back to 2025. They have a little kiss and walk around a bit and it's another musical montage. Always save room for Jesus! Then they have a very chaste hug and Leia goes back to work. Back in the safe house, Roy has found a gothy crucifix necklace for Holly. For a split second when Hannah puts on Holly's necklace, I let my mind believe that this could be a romance plot. Given the build-up, the closeness of them during the prayer scene, the way Hannah gently asks permission to touch her, it would just have been so much more convincing and hold so much more weight than Joshua Wesley just ham-fisting a relationship story with his own girlfriend in there for nepotism value. Back at Lamp HQ and Leia is about to delete more names, but Lucinda catches her. Reminder, it's quite a big room. Leia should have noticed Lucinda coming from 
much further away. She's just a very bad covert operative. Leia is the world's worst liar. Luckily, Lucinda hates her life and her dad. <laughs> She's been able to use her father's trust and her outwardly harsh persona to secretly warn the people that they've been tailing. Turns out Lucinda is kind of a badass, without question the best character in the film, and an animal cracker. Lucinda tells Leia she can't join the resistance, there are too many eyes on her. Cut back to the hideout. Now, in the romance scene, Roy told Leia that he had a surprise for her when she came back from work, so when he starts putting together a makeshift bed and puts a camera and an LED light in front of it, I got really nervous. There's another short musical montage here of just Roy sitting around being nervous. Now everyone is here except for Leia and they're all sat around on this pallet bed with some hooch, I guess. They kick off a live stream communion and all look directly at the camera, which is terrifying. They take communion. We watch the whole thing, it feels as long in this film as it does in church. Hunter says a prayer, I skipped through it. No sir, we don't have anything. I have no evidence. Right, you're fucking fired mate. We're literally tracking their phones, you bellend. Sorry, personal call. Back at Lamp HQ, Luke has predictably shown up to dob in his former friends. This film is so on the nose, I can't believe his character's not called Judas. <laughs> he asks for something in reverse, which is definitely Google Translate version of something in return. For information on their whereabouts, he is like weirdly excited to tell on the people that he used to call family, knowing that they'll be executed. Robots. All of them. Nobody in this film has emotions. Or if they do, they're the wrong emotions. An alarm blares and the bad guys tool up. Leah sits aside to make a call, presumably to the gang. Then the bad guys storm our protagonist's hideout to this rock music, which makes them seem kind of badass, which is weird for the villains. One of them knocks over the little Christmas tree. Why'd you do that, man? They find the Bibles and the DVDs, but the gang are nowhere to be seen. We see Roy sprinting away. It's unclear where any of the others are. Presumably he left them behind, like every time this has happened so far. It doesn't matter. This Wesley bro is the main character. He's the one we care about, our fearless hero and leader. Oh my god, I've just realised this whole film is self-insert Bible fanfiction. Wow. Anyway, dude breaks into a busted old Renault Clio and we come full circle with the scene's opening. Also, he smashes a window on the car and just sits on the glass. Ouch. The film repeats an only very slightly shorter version of the car chase from the beginning. They really could have skipped almost all of it. Padding. But at least we got to see Roy jump over the bonnet again. We cut all the way back or forward to the interrogation scene and Roy is reading out German rights again and I feel like I'm having a heart attack at this point. I'm like, no, not again, not more. I can't do this whole thing again. The idea of being transported back to the beginning of this movie is an actual nightmare for me. I feel like I'm in purgatory. Fortunately, we cut to dad cop doing a brilliant villainous kill them. Execute him. We see the cop car driving in the dark in slow motion. Roy is in the back praying. Roy is taken out to the same woods they filmed in before and has some kind of visions of a future lost. Cut to black, gunshots, roll credits. That's it. <laughs> Movie over. Special thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ. Cheers for watching. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. There are bloopers over the credits as if this entire film isn't a blooper and then that's really the end. Roy's dead. They're all dead. The revolution is over. It's meant to make you think. Reviews. First of all, my review. I was pretty open to this movie when I saw the trailer. I won't rehash everything that I said, but working to a tiny budget, especially over the pandemic and making anything that even resembles a film is an achievement. I said my nice apologetic approach during the trailer review. You can go and watch that if you want to hear a friendlier rundown. Now I've watched the whole film. This is my scathing review. This is barely a film. It could and should have been 40 minutes max. I've never watched anything so padded with so much droning, pointless dialogue. This is one of the worst films I've ever seen. And I love bad movies. Some films are so bad that they're funny. The Room is one of my all time favorites. This is just bad. It's overloaded with exposition. The acting is all terrible. Not even in like a hammy, over the top or stylistic way. The acting in The Room is terrible but they're trying to convey the emotions that their characters are feeling. None of the actors in this could dream of a you're tearing me apart, Lisa, moment. It's all just genuinely bad and really muted, like they were embarrassed to try. It's all dead serious, but no one ever shows any emotion on their face, like it is all performed by robots. And you know what? 
The cheapness of it is fine. They actually do a pretty good job all the time making use of limited space and props. Lamp notwithstanding, their small sets work pretty well. The small signifiers they use to show who is a cop, who is a Christian, are simple and they are effective without overdoing the budget on props or costume. I think it's just too far down the list of important things in a film. The key parts of what makes a film good are the parts that are distinctly lacking. The writing is awful. Every piece of dialogue is hell. It's monologue -y. It's expository. It's circular. It's repetitive. Combined with the terrible acting, I just wanted every scene to end in the hope that something better might come. And it never did. It also took so long to get each character's name. If I was being really generous, I might wonder if that was an intentional theme to kind of highlight the covert nature, the secrecy of the thing. But the cops find them like every five seconds and they have all this alone time together in their secret hideout to talk about nothing and they don't share each other's names. So I think it's more likely just bad writing. The only good thing about this film is that I hated the protagonist and at the end, they killed him. <laughs> Hooray! Thank God for small mercies. Here is the top positive review on Amazon. The acting is generally quite poor, but interesting plot and an uplifting message. One star from Pavel. This is bad. Very bad. Like very, very bad. Script doesn't make any sense. The setting is unbelievable to say the least. Actors don't act. They read lines out loud. It's not the room though. The room had a bad director and script, but kind of decent actors. It had an over the top feeling. This one here is just dull. It's not fun to watch, even if you like bashing bad movies. Pavel? I could not agree more. One star from Erin? Just. Don't. It's unwatchable levels of terrible. I watched a total of five minutes before giving up. Terrible acting, god-awful script, action scenes are laughable, and the premise is ridiculous to boot. This film is only for die-hard film masochists. Ben. Zero star, zero quality, zero action. What a load of old tosh. Don't bother watching. Completely misleading title. Should be How We Hammed About and Created a Christianity Cult. I would rather watch paint dry after bathing in Tabasco sauce and standing on broken glass than watch this. In summary, this film is not worth a hate watch. A couple of commenters suggested this would be a fun movie to rip apart with your friends. Don't. <laughs> I completely disagree. It's not bad in the right ways to be enjoyable. It really is just boring. Parts of this were agony, and I watched it in stages. I didn't do the whole movie in one go. I don't think you could. At its core, it's boring. It's really, really boring and drawn out. For all its other flaws, there is nothing in the world that can make up for a film being fundamentally boring. I don't even care about the conspiracy bit. This film drained my ability to care. Part of me suspects the Wesley Bros to be energy vampires, creating this film as a way to suck the life out of innocent movie watchers. The only tiny glimpse of anything genuine I can see in this movie is the hint that Joshua Wesley thinks he's fantastic. And maybe this film is just a hopeful attempt at having that validated by other people. Zero out of 10, minus 50 out of 10, do not even hate watch, I beg of you. Well, now that that's over, I feel like a tremendous weight has been lifted. I'm ready to live again. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Do leave your thoughts down below. As much as I hated the experience of watching this film, I really enjoyed writing my notes and filming this review. I love doing these. If you want to see more of this kind of thing, let me know. Leave your film suggestions down below. I've had a couple since uh, doing 2025 that I thought will be quite funny. Don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already so that you don't miss future reviews. Do check out Emma Thorne Extra for the video that I decided to make during filming this. I'm going to use 2025 to show you all of the big no-nos on screen acting. There's also some other fun behind the scenes stuff there. I've got so much fun stuff planned. I'm really excited about that channel. Please do check it out and subscribe. Do come and hang out with me on Twitch in a couple of hours. We're gonna hang out, we're gonna play some games. It's a good time to chat and say hi. And if you like gaming content, do also consider checking out my YouTube gaming channel, Little Duck Gaming. For comment priority and some very silly emotes, you can become a channel member. Of course, the best way to support this channel, if you like what I do, is over on the Patreon. With that, I must give a very big shout out and a thank you to my giant chickens and colossal quackers over on Patreon. <laughs>
thank you so much for watching. I can't wait to never think about this film ever, ever again. Have yourselves a very lovely week, and I will see you really soon.